face this first, but I have to bring out Linda. There are three women who stepped up beyond belief. I am not a cook. Judy, come up here. Three or four months ago. Oh, we should have a pop-up. <laughs> um, <laughs> not there, not there. Someone just asked me if we're going to do this every month. Um, <laughs> thinking maybe, but maybe we'll get 20 people. Maybe, hopefully, we crossed our fingers, and 75 people. Thank you. And we had to turn. There's people on the waiting list. We had to turn people away. So it just shows you the demand and the interest and growing. Um, popularity of plant-based eating. And it also shows you, I mean, pulling this off is really the dedication, the energy, and the skill of a bunch of women. Women. It's just extraordinary. Everything was Everything was delicious. Incredible. And then Susan Greenberg and then Linda Jones. I mean, it was a lot of woman hours, and I appreciate it. I really do. Um, so thank you. It, it, and I do have to mention one. We this started Brittany Gerudi. I have to say this without getting too emotional. Um, but she was another plant-based chef that was in on the planning and doing and everything. And her mother became very ill um, and passed away on Friday. So we really had to drop out uh, a few weeks ago. And so we certainly have her in our hearts and our family. As I said that. Okay, so in the more, a few more thank yous. Uh, my daughters, Kylie and Jenny, wherever they are, they're back there doing dishes. That's okay. <laughs> Okay, Jim Jones, who was fantastic with the with the setup and getting everything. My husband Rick, who helped us set up and tickets, and Greenberg, who helps us check in. Um, Lulu, Lulu, yeah. photographer, she's taking a bite over there. <laughs> photographer and video woman. Okay, and Sharon, where's Sharon Gregory? Which table? Oh yeah, stand up. Oh my gosh, look how happy she is. She's a cheese but fantastic and she donated some more for those nacho no cheese nacho um, for the basket up there and you can get them in we would talk many closer in Whole Foods online you'll be at the vegan fest right probably okay. Um, I just have to acknowledge also there's physicians, nurses, healthcare providers that really we give our special thank you for supporting us. We need you in our healthcare system. So if you could just raise your hand, I know there's a whole table full right in front of me. But if you are a healthcare practitioner, just let them know because it's just so appreciative that you're here and joining us. Um, we have a birthday. I don't know if he knows it. Mark. Uh, happy birthday, Mark. Yeah. Uh -huh. He gets his own cake. Yeah. Ah, uh, there it comes. Okay, Linda's giving him his own cake. Is it allowed to be here? <laughs> That's going to be hard to get into 75 pieces, isn't it? <laughs> So, let me introduce our speaker. Um, Dr. Natalie Gentili is a board certified family medicine and lifestyle medicine physician. And she's going to be opening her own practice, Gentili Family Direct Care Primary. Direct Primary Care, I'm sorry, in Highland Park very soon. Um, there's Natalie strives to raise her family as plant based and counsels patients to use food as medicine. So tonight she's going to talk about how she works to help patients make sustainable lifestyle changes within the context of our current healthcare system. 
And if you want to take notes, there's a little pencil on your card, and you can use the back of your place cards. We think of everything, you know? And then when she's done, questions, we're going to pull, Elena's going to pull the graphic tickets, and that is it. Okay. Hi, you guys. So, uh, I think I'm making a lot of people nervous tonight. <laughs> it's not going to happen for a few more weeks. <laughs> I may be 30, 36 weeks pregnant, but we've got some time, so at least another hour. So, we're, don't worry about that. Um, so I won't, I won't talk long tonight, but this is just such a, a huge honor, so I'm really grateful to be here with everybody and to meet you all, and I'm glad to be back in the greatest city of all times, because we just moved back a month ago, so go Pittsburgh. Yeah, right? So just a little bit about myself, I've, um, I've always planned on becoming a physician, so my dad uh, is an ob guy, so he delivered babies, so I used to deliver my Raggedy Ann dolls babies. Um, <laughs> naturally, that made sense. And, then as an athlete and a fitness enthusiast through life, I really just brought that into the forefront of my mind. So I knew I was gonna be a doctor and I knew that lifestyle and healthy living was gonna be um, my priority. I did my pre-med at St. Vincent College, if anybody here's a bear cat, uh, and then uh, pit med for medical school where I met my amazing husband, and who's also in the, in the audience here tonight. And when we were in medical school, one day we watched Forks Over Knives. I don't know if you guys have heard of this uh, documentary. <laughs> Just a little, little known documentary. Uh, but we watched Forks Over Knives. And I have to say, we, we couldn't unsee what we, what we saw. You know, we were studying to become physicians, and we learned nothing about nutrition in medical school. That's not part of your curriculum in most medical school training. And that's starting to change a bit. Um, but when we went, that was not part of what we learned. We immediately became vegetarian. Um, at that point, we were really bulking up and building muscles. So we were eating a lot of eggs, turkey for lunch, chicken breast for dinner, because how else would we get our protein, right? Um, and so we watched Forks Over Knives and thought, uh-oh, how are we going to grocery shop now? Um, but we realized that it was our responsibility to, to act on what we learned. We both had family histories and personal histories of various chronic diseases, high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, cancer. And we thought, I, I can't go down that same path. And this was a way to, to at least try and, and lower that risk. Went on to do our residency at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And that's where we've been for the past five years. And I met uh, one of my best friends and co-residents there, said, have you heard of Nutrition Facts with Dr. Michael Greger? And I thought, well, I don't know. No, and she was very smart, so I thought, well, I should probably listen to her um, and listen to this guy talk a little bit, and I was pretty hooked, as I'm sure a lot of people in this room can relate. Um, and again, it was that feeling of, I, I can't unsee this, I can't unlearn this, and I, it's my responsibility to, to bring this into my life as a doctor, and my life with my family as well. So I became boarded in family medicine, and I also uh, took the, sat for the inaugural exam for lifestyle medicine board certification. And that's a field that's really aiming for preventing, treating, and reversing chronic disease. You'd think that we don't necessarily need to have a field for that, right? It's not just being a doctor. It's not just what we're supposed to be doing all the time. But it's not. It's not part of our training. And it's not part of, of how we are practicing medicine every day in, in the traditional healthcare system. Um, I'm sure for some of you that doesn't come as a surprise, uh, but for me, it was a way that I was going to make sure that I was trained specifically to be able to practice lifestyle medicine and help patients through that journey. So after I was on staff at the Mayo Clinic for a couple of years, it was a perfect transition time. We were going to be moving back to Pittsburgh. My husband was done with his urology residency, and I knew I couldn't practice in this traditional healthcare system anymore and feel like I was doing what was right for the patient because that's my only responsibility as a doctor. So I decided that I'm going to open my own clinic, which is scary. Um, I'm opening my own practice. It's called Gentilly Family Direct Primary Care, and we'll talk a little bit about that later and how I feel like that's at least my solution um, to try and contribute to the health of this amazing city that we live in. I do want to start with some patient stories. So have any of you ever been a, a, a patient before? <laughs> yeah, me too. It's not easy, right? Um, 
have any of you here faced a time where you've had to make a lifestyle change? So prevent a chronic disease, reverse a chronic disease, start taking a medicine, start exercising when you've not done it before, etc. Who here has had to make those changes? It's not easy, right? It's a very, very challenging time. And if you've ever been along that spectrum of health where you're trying to prevent becoming diabetic because everyone in your family is diabetic, or you've been told that you need to start taking medications and you've never taken a medication in your life, you realize that it's really nice to have somebody along on that journey with you, right? It's nice not to be alone. So I'm gonna start with uh, my, my patient, JM. She was, she's a 55-year-old woman who I saw uh, last year for the first time. She came in for an acute visit. So it was my first time meeting her. She had gout again, and she had gout all the time. And I'm looking back in her chart, she's been dealing with this excruciating pain for years now. And every time she would come in, foot swollen, red, hot, and she'd be treated for her pain, and it would get better, but then it would come back again. That is not right. So something needed to be done. And I'm looking back in this woman's chart, and I'm not seeing where somebody has intervened, right, to say why. Why is this happening? And why is this affecting her quality of life? So I treated her immediately to help her pain, but I ended our visit by asking her a simple question. How do you think that your lifestyle plays into these gout flares? these inflammations of your joint, this pain that you're experiencing over and over again. How do you think your lifestyle plays into that? And she just looked slack-jawed. She said, I mean, I, I think it certainly does. I definitely have some habits that I need to change. And um, I said, we don't have to do anything about that today. But would you come back in a week when you're feeling better, pain's under control, and we can talk a little bit more? And she agreed. So for those following couple of months, I saw her every few weeks or so, and I gave her some homework. She washed the forks of her knives. She took some of the plant-based um, resources that I had a list of, and just I just gave her, and I said, just see what you think. Don't even, don't pass any judgment. Just see what you think. And she just came back and consumed it. And it was eye-opening for her. She had been drinking a little bit more than she should, alcohol-wise. She was under so much stress with her job. She ran a restaurant and it was exhausting for her for the past 20 years. She was not exercising, and she didn't follow any particular type of healthy, healthy eating diet. So there were a lot of places where we could work together, and that's what we did. Um, I, I treated her blood pressure in, in the short term to make sure that she was safe, and very quickly we were able to come off of medications. It's, it's one of my favorite things to do, which is de-prescribing, um, instead of prescribing, <laughs> right? Um, prescribe a, med a medication and it's super easy let me tell you it is really hard to de-prescribe a medication and it takes it takes time and it takes trust between a doctor and a patient to be able to say you don't need this anymore so that's what we did with Jane and we took her off medications and she um, I just want to tell you some of her numbers this is pretty cool her total cholesterol went from 254 to 188 in about three months her triglycerides, which I wanted to be lower, that's a type of cholesterol that I want to be lower, went from 315 to 149. And her blood pressure was normal, and her, her glucose, her sugars, were normal. And so all of a sudden, she wasn't a diabetic anymore. And she wasn't a blood pressure patient anymore. She was Jane, and she was moving. And she was all of a sudden had a quality of life. So she, she moved, she retired, which was cool, and she called me from Arizona a few months ago because she wanted to see how I was feeling because she knew I was pregnant. How's the baby doing? Um, I just went to a vegan conference. I was like, what? <laughs> I mean, this woman came in and she was just sassing me when we first met, and she, I just went to a vegan conference. I was like, all right, well, get it, girl. She was, um, she was just so happy, and I thought, well, that wasn't that hard, right? We just needed some time together. We just needed to work together and, and just empower. That's what it's about, is just empowering humans. That's what we're all in this together. Another really amazing experience was when I ran the, the CHIP program, so Complete Health Improvement Program. Um, if any of you have heard of that, uh, through the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, I became a facilitator. And 
we got some funding for it at Mayo through our department. And so I thought, well, who do we want to put through this program to start? And as I looked around our team room at clinic and saw the donuts and the Mountain Dew, I thought, who better to start with than everyone here right now that I'm working with? So we got about 11 total people. It was desk staff, secretaries, residents, the staff physicians, and we, and we did CHIP. So we did the 12-week program. We worked on stress reduction. We worked on mindful eating. We went through all of the videos that we needed to watch, learned whole foods, plant-based cooking and eating. There was one woman that really stood out to me. She, um, she was young. She had several kids. She said, I haven't bought a bathing suit in about 15 years. I'm, just, I'm mortified. And at the end of CHIP, she bought one. And she felt good. We had people losing up to 40 pounds. We had people going off of medications and feeling really empowered by that. And all of a sudden, that was trickling down. So we started the spark, and it just was going. I mean, all of a sudden, our team room was having fresh vegetables and hummus. And people were drinking more water and taking walks together. Again, this wasn't that hard, right? It just took empowerment and, and encouragement. So I was obviously healthy living and lifestyle changes were a part of what was important to me, OK? And so I'm trying to think about how I can how I can incorporate this as my, in my life as a physician. And the healthcare system that we're in right now can sometimes present barriers. I don't know if you guys have realized that as practicing healthcare providers, as patients, it's not, it's not that easy to get that message across to patients, and it's not that easy as a patient to receive that message that you need to make some lifestyle changes. I was just in an Uber the other day, and like super nubby of me, but this guy and the Uber driver had what's called a pick line. So it's an IV that you can continually access if you need to. He said, well, what's, why, do you have a, why do you have a pick line? Are you okay? And he was so open. He was so nice. He had been getting IV antibiotics because he, he had an infection in his foot from really bad diabetes. And he had just been in the hospital for days with this infection. I took care of a lot of patients like that on the hospital service at the Mayo Clinic. And a lot of that can be re reversed and prevented. He didn't, uh, you don't need to have terribly controlled diabetes. You don't need to have your toe amputated. You don't need to have this happen. But somebody needs to hold your hand through the journey and help you prevent that. He said when he, whenever he would go to the doctor, he wouldn't get much attention. He would wait for an hour, then see somebody <laughs> for a few minutes. Nobody was telling him, like, this doesn't have to happen. This doesn't have to turn out this way for you. The hard part is that with our current healthcare model not fully supporting that, um, we're at a bit of butting heads. So, how, do we have any athletes in the room? Yeah? So, this, this my mom, who's not an athlete at all, um, she said, this reminds me a lot of a sports analogy. So when I was playing softball in high school, um, my dad would make me go to the batting cages, not me. He would encourage me to go to the batting cages all the time, right? And when you're an athlete and you're playing a sport, you go to practice a lot. And you're practice, practice, practice. And that's how you get better. And that's how you make change. And that's how you improve. Why then do we go for one visit to see a doctor, get told that we need to start exercising and eating healthy, and that's the one chance we get? Because the next time you come in, which could be months later, and those changes haven't been made, you're going on a medication. Right? You've tried the lifestyle change. Why is, that, why is there that discrepancy? How are we supposed to improve? How are we supposed to get better and keep practicing if we don't have those touch points? I'm not saying that I have the answers and the solution to everything uh, by any means, um, but I think that we can do better. When we see patients right now with chronic diseases, we go through typically an algorithmic approach to things nowadays. If you have diabetes, these are the medications we start with. If you have high blood pressure, this is what we start with. The first step is usually lifestyle change, but that's a little vague. That's really hard. That's not tangible like a medication is. And so it's easy to say, make these changes, but then we're going to start a medication if it doesn't work well for you. Right? That's the easier way. It astounds me that 80 plus percent of our healthcare spending is on diseases that are because of poor lifestyle choices. 80 plus percent. I mean, that's we can do something better. We can help patients. We can help our family members by making better choices. I saw this woman who was in her 60s who came in with really bad knee pain. 
and for years she'd been told she can't have a knee replacement and she didn't really know why necessarily but when I looked back in the chart at her notes from the surgeons it was needs to lose weight needs to lose weight needs to lose weight we're not going to re replace her knee and I looked at her at our visit and I said has anybody talked to you about what role your weight is playing in your knee pain bawling she was she's crying and I thought oh no what did I do I didn't mean to offend you know I'm sitting there and she said you actually are the first person to ever bring that up and it's something I've been thinking about this whole time. And I don't know what to do, how to do anything about it. And then I started crying, right? And we're just sitting there because that's really tough. When you've been told you're excruciating pain, we can't do much about it right now. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> We've got to you know, address the underlying issue here. And it's hard to hear that, I'm sure. You're overweight, you need to lose weight. But here's how. That's what the next line needs to be. Here's how. Each patient is a human and a beautiful, special entity. Each one of us has all of these amazing factors that go into us as a human being. Financial, spiritual, our health history, our habits, our family histories. And that all contributes to how we do when it comes to someone wanting us to be healthier. When it comes to a doctor saying, you need to change your lifestyle, that's a really loaded, loaded prescription. So we need to be able to treat each person like that. Mm -hmm. In the title of my talk, I had asked Sally, can we just say making these sustainable lifestyle changes? And I wanted that word sustainable because I think that's the key. Sustainability of lifestyle changes because one and done is not gonna do it. How can we work together to make tailored specific plans in this relationship between practitioner, doctor, and patient so that things can last and so that we can live quality lives. It's not going to work when we advise a patient to walk more if they live in a neighborhood that's completely unsafe for them to walk. It's not going to be effective to ask somebody to eat fruits and vegetables when they don't even know what that looks like. And it, maybe that's not prevalent in this room, and maybe it is, but I've seen it, where people have no idea what, a re what real fruits and vegetables look like and where to get them affordably. We need to know the context of, of what humans that we're working with so that we can actually help people thrive. Okay, so what are we gonna do about it? So my solution, my personal solution at this point, as a, as a young doc who's full of energy, is um, my primary care practice that I'm opening. So the main barriers that I've identified uh, in the healthcare system currently are the following. Time with, between doctor and patient, Continuity of care, so being able to see somebody multiple times, seeing the same person multiple times, so you're not reinventing the re wheel, retelling your story over and over again. Access directly to your doctor, so imagine calling and not talking to about five people in between you and your doctor and hoping that you actually hear from them at some point. Cutting out insurance, cutting out things that affect our cost of care and our ability to afford Healthcare, insurance is really expensive. I don't, it doesn't matter who you are, it's expensive <laughs> to, to get it. And then the quality of your ability as the doctor to actually talk about lifestyle and counsel about it. So here's how I'm gonna combat that. And there are other docs in this city who are doing this uh, direct primary care model as well. Time, it's not an issue. Hour long visits, that's gonna be my practice. And I need that to be able to help people. And I think that it's not terrible for you to ask for that from your doctor, whoever your doctor is. Continuity of care. You see one doctor. You don't see a bunch of other people on their team. It doesn't have to be like that. You don't have to retell your story all the time. No middlemen. Talking directly to a person who's known you for your whole life. That's how the old family doctor used to be. Right? When you were raised by, you know, when your family saw the same doc, that's unheard of nowadays, it feels like. That used to be the norm, and that doesn't have to stop now. Community education. Things like tonight, where you've got people together from a community learning from each other and spreading news to each other. That's the spark of that flame, and that's how people make changes. 
Cutting out insurance. So having an affordable way that you can see a doc every month without having to worry about paying for labs and meds through an insurance company. Insurance doesn't work for everybody. It doesn't work for me, and I'm not gonna use it in my practice. We can talk about that personally if you want, about how that looks and what that looks like. Um, but it's being done in this city, and it's a pretty amazing opportunity. Quality of lifestyle counseling. Back to that de-prescribing, right? So knowing how to safely de-prescribe. And that's what sets apart a lifestyle medicine doc from, from somebody who hasn't been trained in lifestyle medicine or healthcare change, you know, health changes, lifestyle changes. We gotta be able to safely take you off insulin. We've gotta be able to safely take you off your blood pressure medication and not knowledgeably do that. My call to action. So for all of us, whether you're gonna be, whether you're a doc in the system, the traditional healthcare model, whether you're practicing in a different way, whether you're a patient who wants to experience a different type of healthcare, or you love your doctor and you're staying with them in the traditional model, it, it doesn't matter. We can all expect more. And that's my call to action tonight. Trust that doctor-patient relationship. And if you don't, find someone who you do. That is a beautiful and sacred, sacred relationship, and you deserve the best. You deserve to be with somebody who is not gonna look at you like you're crazy when you tell them that you went to this dinner tonight, and that you might wanna try to be Whole Foods plant-based if you're not already. You deserve to have somebody who wants to help you grocery shop, maybe, and teach you how certain foods might help certain diseases that you wanna combat or reverse. You deserve to have somebody who wants to de-prescribe medications and not make you a slave to pills. You're not a one-stop shop. Everyone is a special entity and you deserve to be treated that way when you see the doctor. We took this oath to do no harm and I know the majority of docs out there hold that very sacred and so find somebody who you feel really takes that seriously and is gonna take you seriously. To do no harm, we have to be willing to hold our patient's hands through the thick and thin and to help you live this quality, quality life so that you can thrive. Thank you. My question is, are you, when are you running for president? <laughs> My husband will tell you I don't know geography, I don't know politics well, but I'm a good doctor. That's That's how she delivers. After I deliver. <laughs> I have cards and chapsticks over there, by the way. I'm all about chapsticks. I was just going to say, I'm going to put them on. So what's your alternative to insurance? So, I'm going to put that on you. So, what's your alternative to insurance? So, my practice is a, a flat monthly fee that you pay, and you have full access to me. You can have your own insurance if you feel that that's important to you, and some people can't afford insurance. But typically, like a high deductible plan for insurance works very well with direct primary care. Any other quick questions? Can I also do you have any other cards with you? I do. Yeah, yeah, I've I've got got a, okay, awesome. yeah I yeah. put all of her cards and the chapstick. Right Are you going to be working with like dietitians and other practitioners that you'll train or that are trained previously in your, you know, the whole food plant based? Yes, that's the ultimate goal. Once I start, um, is to start to build that community resource base with the dietitian. Yes, and whatever other community resources that I find, because I'll I'll seek them out. Yeah. I'm excited. Thanks. Thanks, you guys. Thanks for your time. I really am. That was an excellent talk. I just have to say, talking about Dr. Greger, there's somebody who came who works with Dr. Greger. Woo! Kate, if you want to. Or no. And, yes, that's where I'm getting to. Do you know any speakers at the NAFS conference? The NAFS. The National, I mean, the North American Vegetarian Society has their annual conference at the University of Pittsburgh, Johnstown. It is next week. The keynote speaker on Saturday night is Dr. Michael Greger. Yeah. And there is an array of speakers. I will be speaking. Yes, I'm doing three workshops there. Yes, yes. Um, 
and, and if you're going plant-based Pittsburgh, we're going to eat Saturday more Saturday dinner, Saturday lunch. I got it. Um, and then one of the downstairs dining just to get to know each other. But it's a great opportunity year after year. They come back. It's so close. Oh, I think T. Colin Campbell is going to be there this year. Yeah. Um, so, where's, uh, we have our Elena here is just eager to pull raffle tickets. So everybody get out your raffle tickets. So what are you going to start with here? Three, three, four, two, oh, zero, seven. Oh. 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 